I have a kind of a cold, so if I speak like I'm talking through my nose, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, I'm glad to be here in Poway. It's my second time. Uh, I love the city. I got here early. Came up, uh, where did we come up? Fr no, no, from this back way, and it was really, really pretty. I thought it was a great town. Hi, Jason. Um, I actually was killing some time. We took a ride up of uh, Angelique. Is that right? Angelique Street? And we saw, like, this big mountain range, and that was kind of cool. I'm from Texas, so we don't really have these kind of mountains. Uh, so I get all giddy, I, I guess. Uh, anyway, um, I, I am a former believer, and uh, I'm a former Calvinist, actually. And um, I'm not afraid to walk back into that worldview. I understand the worldview. I was in it. I understand it. I get it. I'm going to tell you tonight why I'm not in it anymore. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to come over to my worldview now. And if you can find my worldview, tell me what it is. I bet you won't, you won't. I'm an atheist by default. Okay? That's it. I don't agree with the Christian worldview anymore, so that was my position afterwards, and that's where I'm at. I mean, there's a lot of atheist camps out there. I'm not part of anyone. I'm not a part of any atheist groups. I'm not a part of the Freedom, Freedom of Religion Foundation or the ACLU. Uh, I know a lot of different atheists that are. Um, I... Uh, I rub elbows with a lot of them, but I do not agree with every single thing that they stand for. Um, I'm not a strong atheist in the sense of objectivism, so that's one thing that Paul probably knows already. Um, I know a lot of objectivists, but I don't adhere to a lot of their principles. Um, and now I'm going to read the boring stuff. Uh, the decision to trust Christ comes from a value assignment, a preposition relative to a structured historical path of experience. A worldview is held by certain beliefs and suppositions. Paul likes to talk about worldviews. I do too. But what are the beliefs and suppositions based on? Where is the basis for that? If I suppose it's going to rain tomorrow, I hope that I'm basing it on some data and I'm not just dreaming it. So to hold a worldview is to say that you have reason for maintaining it. Those reasons are what I intend on probing tonight. And that's not to say that you should leave on my account as I said today. But I will tell you, that, uh, I'll tell you about the lack of data that I sustain on now. And it's kind of funny that we're having this debate, you know, does God exist? I mean, we wouldn't have a debate over does Paul exist, do we? Would we? We wouldn't. He's right here. We can all see him. We wouldn't debate over the existence of this church or the existence of President Bush or the existence of Oprah Winfrey. But we're debating the existence of God and it's supposed to be this obvious thing, isn't it? That's the presupposition from the Christian worldview. Well, I'm sorry, I don't see it. And I'll show you. Now, it is important to understand what we're debating tonight. This is not a shoving match between me and Paul. I respect Paul. Um, this is a matter of if Paul can show me the existence of God, I want to see it, I desire it, that's what I'm here for. I'm a searcher. That's what led me out of the faith. And if there's something that Paul can point to that shows me the existence of his God, I want to look at it, I want to see it, and I'm ready. I desire to see it. Now, Paul made some hay on the issue of existence existing. And what that really means... <laughs> is that you have to exist in order to come to the Bible. In other words, the Bible is data. Okay, the Bible is data. You have to exist first before you come encounter with this data. In other words, God exists, but he exists in data, right? No one would know about God unless somebody had not told them about God from the pages of Scripture, either some other... Uh, uh, theological position, you could be a Buddhist, you could be a Muslim, but the bottom line here is that the term God lives in a book. That's a simple fact. And you have to know what that book is prior to understanding what God is. You're not going to look at the Bible and say it's a cookbook. You have to know and you have to be able to differentiate the two. And what I'm going to say is that because of that, the, the Bible is full of data that you either read or hear. Uh, via sense receptors, okay? And uh, names like God, Jesus, and Paul, sin, the Torah, all these things, all the prescriptive view on reality that is prescribed through the Torah, all sense data. You read it, you heard it, if you're blind, you felt it with the braille, sign language, whatever it was, it, it was contingent on the sense receptors. 
And what I'm going to say is I'm going to say the Christian worldview actually rests on the shoulders of natural man's axioms. In other words, identity, existence, we have to differentiate between things. It's going to rest on mine. That's what I hold to now. Um, you can't change a light bulb unless you have a ladder, can you? That's what Christian worldview is on natural axioms. Without the natural axioms, Christianity would not exist. You have to get on top of the ladder to change the light bulb. And that's my axiom. That's my worldview. I'm the ladder. Um, the genetic roots of epistemology, science, psychology, and sociology, must by necessity rely on the material act atomic, atomic layers. Without mine, he can't have his. And I'll show this tonight. There are tons of worldviews. I can make one up right now. I can make up a really goofy worldview with my family. I could move out to like some mountain out here, raise my family, tell my daughters, inject them with my worldview. Now they're justified in believing that worldview because they only know the worldview through me. They're dependent on me. I'm sure some of you guys are parents. And when you raise your children, you injected them socially with the Christian worldview, or whatever world, worldview you had at that time. And I could, I could make up all kinds of issues pertaining to reality. I could, I could create a web, or a, not a web, um, I could create a grid, okay? I could fabricate this, this grid. When they look at reality, they see reality through this grid. And, and that grid is justifiable for them. It interprets reality. It's like a light bulb. You have a light bulb, you have different lenses that go across it, or gels. Worldviews are just gels. That's all they are. They're gels. They, they change reality. Okay? And there's a contrast in gels. And, and whose worldview is right or wrong, I'm just telling you why I don't hold to this worldview anymore. Um, <clears throat> let's get into prophecy. That's one of the things. I'm going to go into some of the things why I left. Okay? And, and we'll get into this later, I'm sure. But uh, I, hold, I, I know Gene holds a lot of prophecies in, from our last debate. And um, they really mean nothing. <laughs> they really don't. Um, when their fulfillment is also written within the same continuity of the predictions. This is a self-verification and wishful thinking to me. As a believer, I held that the Bible was unique and that only God could make prophecies that were 100% accurate. I mean, how could that be done if there was no God, right? But I had, as I have discovered, <clears throat> and you may do this as well, there are no prophecies that have been shown to be valid. No book can both make a prophecy and declare that prophecy true at the same time. Uh, prophecies are interpreted after the fact and then retrofitted to make them appear valid. Uh, prophecies such as relating to the virgin birth of Christ are then retrofitted and are clearly erred. There is even word that there are double prophecies. How convenient, huh? Um, also, too, another thing for, for my leaving was, was the, the, the God of the Bible. Um, he, he seemed that the Old Testament, it seemed to be a little bit more of a war Hungry, excuse me, wow. Did you send that up here? Um, <laughs> it seemed to be more of a war-hungry God. I mean, look at, look at Numbers 31. Gosh, this is really, really sad for me. I, I must have skimmed over this during my probing in the Bible before I committed myself to Christ. Uh, Numbers 31, it was a vengeance on the Midianites. I don't know if you guys are aware of that verse. Uh, you've got Zechariah 14.1, Psalms 137.9. You've got Hosea, you've, you've, got a, uh, you've got Isaiah even. Gosh, that's, that's some scary stuff. Um, five, I think Isaiah 5. And it's like they rejected God and he wipes them out. They rejected this, they rejected that. Well, why do you reject something? Why do you reject something? Why do you reject a proposition at any time? Whether it's over the, 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 the Jets-San uh, Diego game. I know you guys don't want to think about that. But no matter what it is, sports... Anything. You, you either accept something on its merit or you reject it. And, and, and that's a relative issue. Okay? You conclude on a relative basis. Um, you may think that you have choices, but you are really just arriving at the items 
by way of desire, via induction. Uh, rather than a deliberation, rather a deliberation moment only possible by way of a historical path of personal, particular sense experience. And when you deliberate while somebody is giving you a proposition, such as God exists, Jesus died for your sins, you deliberate over that. You're, you're, you're thinking, you're going, okay, let's think about this. It's just like the kid before he believes in Santa. He has a sufficient amount of data. He uses those tools. They're the only tools he can use. He's the only one that can get into his head and think about what you're, you're telling him. And, and just like the sufficient amount of data that, that a child reasons with before he accepts the proposition that Santa exists, heck, look at even Santa Claus. Santa Claus is in the mall. Kids are justified in their belief in Santa Claus. Kid, parents leave partially eaten cookies out for them. Gosh, they, <laughs> they better be justified. That's pretty good stuff. But just like accepting the proposition that Christianity exists comes from a rejection or a, an acceptance. And people fall into those necessary or sufficient prepositions to hear in the gospel. I was a Catholic. I was raised a Catholic. And I already knew about Jesus and God and sin and Satan and demons and blah, blah, blah. And in my 20s, after high school, I, I called myself kind of like an agnostic, God-fearing agnostic. And I got to the Bible um, in 2001 after September 11th. And I guess I would say that I already had my foot in the door of a lot of the theology stuff. And so when I actually accepted Christ, I, I kind of felt like it was kind of easy because I already had the presuppositions that there was a God. Why did I have those presuppositions? I didn't go buy them at the store. My parents were raised that way, and their parents were raised that way. And, and this is a relative position. I'm not talking about everybody was a Christian before they were saved. I'm just talking about me. <clears throat> and so it, it was kind of easy, you know. Yeah, of course I bought sin. Yeah, it's so easy to paint a picture of sin. Oh, don't you think murder is wrong? Don't you see pain? Don't you see rape is wrong? Of course, I, I personally reject that stuff. But what do you mean by it's wrong? What do you mean by it's wrong? Who says it's wrong? Because someone doesn't like it? Is that because of their opinion? Are they objective or is it subjective? Is it relative to them? Or is there a standard that is being... It, it, where's the standard for that? I'd love to see it. Um, Rejection of this worldview comes from a matter of value assignment and tastes. Humans have nerves and taste buds and sense receptors that record whether something is accepted or rejected. Um, look at like Home Depot, for example. Say you were told that you had to build a house inside Home Depot. You couldn't use any materials outside of the house, uh, outside of Home Depot. You built this house, you used all the different parts that you could find within the confines, within the parameters of that. And at the end, you had this house, but you were being told that you did it wrong. That is what God is like. He sets the parameters for all of our traits and all of our taste, value, uh, taste assignments and value assignments and our, and our desire formulations, our will formulation. He gives all the possible parameters of character, uh, um, interest, and we're supposed to know better. What, what, what is that? Are, are we set up for failure? I think we are. Um, if I break God's decrees, I am doing so on the basis that I don't value them. So ask yourself, how do we grow value? Why don't we all have the same value and tastes? Because we are all unique agents with our own relative histories. Um, I want to talk about... Um, an example here for, for a second with sense perception. If we all stood around this church and took a picture, um, you, we may see, see, there's a thousand pictures. Um, we have one camera, I mean one, house, one church, but all these different perceptions. We have an objective church. There may be variations of these perceptions, of these snapshots, but you're not going to change the church. The church is going to stay the same. It's got an objective identity to it. It has an existence. And so don't worry about sense perception. Sense perception is how you come to know anything. How do you come to you know your name? How do you know Jesus? How do you know the Bible? How do you reject the Bible? It's based on your value assignment 
your rejection of that hypothesis, your rejection of that proposition, your rejection of the conclusions that people make when they assert it, and uh, don't, be, don't worry about that. Thank you.